Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today, we're tackling a truly fundamental topic, the female reproductive system. It's a fascinating one. Absolutely. We've got a stack of detailed physiology notes here, and our mission really is to pull out the essentials for you. We want to give you a clear, engaging understanding of how it all works, you know, from the start of puberty through the monthly cycles without getting totally bogged down in medical jargon. Yeah, to cut through the complexity a bit. Exactly. Think of this as your shortcut to understanding the key players and the uh, the incredible orchestration of events. We'll be focusing on what kicks off puberty, the amazing development of exogenesis, that monthly rhythm of the ovaries, and of course the hormones that control everything. Okay, let's unpack this. Sounds good. It really is a system where everything is connected, working with, well, remarkable precision. Our notes give us that blueprint, the parts, the processes. But what's really cool is seeing how it all comes together, driven by those hormonal signals for, you know, the basic purpose of reproduction. So let's start right at the beginning. Puberty. That's the big shift, isn't it? From childhood to being reproductively capable. Our notes say this usually happens between, what, 8 and 14 for girls and 9 and 14 for boys. Typically, yeah, in that range. But what's the initial scark? What actually gets the ball rolling? It seems like the exact trigger isn't completely clear yet. That's right. The uh, precise starting gun is still something researchers are working on, but our sources point to two main contributing factors. First, there's what's described as an intrinsic brain timing mechanism. Okay. Yeah. There's this interesting example involving agonadal subjects. These are individuals born without ovaries or tests who still show an increase in reproductive hormones around the usual age for puberty. Wow. It strongly suggests there's some kind of internal clock in the brain that starts ticking regardless of the gonads themselves. That's wild. So the brain just kind of knows it's time. What about the second factor? That hypothalamic gonadostat theory. Sounds a bit technical. It does sound technical, but the idea is basically about sensitivity. It's how the hypothalamus, that key control center in the brain, changes how sensitive it is to sex hormones. Mm. During childhood, it's super sensitive, even to tiny amounts of estradiol and testosterone. And this sensitivity acts like a break, keeping everything pretty quiet, reproductively speaking. Right. But as puberty gets closer, this sensitivity decreases. The, the hypothalamus isn't held back by those low levels anymore. And lifting that break allows for more GnRH, that's gonadotropin releasing hormone, to be released in pulses. GnRH, that's the signal from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland, another control center. Exactly. And initially, this increased GnRH pulsing happens mainly at night. Ah, uh, okay. So it's like... The brain's thermostat for these hormones gets reset, letting the signals get louder. Makes sense. And for girls specifically, what are the physical changes we start to see? Well, the larch that's breast budding is usually the first sign you'd notice. Then, following that, you get pubarch, the appearance of pubic and armpit hair. And that's driven by different hormones. Primarily, yes. That hair growth comes mainly from adrenal androgens, hormones made by the adrenal glands, which sit on top of the kidneys. After that, there's the growth spurt, you know, that rapid increase in height. And then finally, menarche, the first period, which usually happens about two to three years after the breast budding starts. A pretty clear sequence then. Our notes really stress the role of ovarian steroids, particularly estradiol. What's estradiol actually doing during this whole transition? Estradiol is, well, fundamental. It drives the development of the secondary sex organs and characteristics. So it stimulates breast growth, the maturing of the reproductive organs themselves, uterus, vagina, it causes fat to be distributed in that typical feminine pattern, and it's also really important for bone maturation. It's basically shaping those physical changes of female puberty. Okay. And the adrenal androgens we mentioned, we know they do the hair growth, but do they have other jobs too? Oh, absolutely. Beyond the pubic and axillary hair, they also contribute to the growth of the clitoris. They have a protein anabolic effect, meaning they help build protein, which contributes to that physical growth spurt. And interestingly, they also ramp up the activity of sebaceous glands in the skin. Ah, so that sometimes leads to oilier skin or acne around puberty. Exactly. That can be a factor. Okay, so puberty gets the system going. And then we move into oopongenesis. Yeah. The actual creation of the eggs, the female gametes. How does that process work right from the start? Oopongenesis is pretty amazing, actually. It starts way before a female is even born. During fetal development, you have these precursor cells, eutagonia, dividing like crazy. By mitosis, they reach a peak of maybe six to seven million. Wow, millions. Millions. But then before birth, most of these actually die off. The number drops significantly down to about two million. Then around six months after birth, all the ones that are left turn into primary eutocytes. 
And these basically hit pause. They just hang out in a state of suspended development until puberty. So they just wait for years. Yep. So by the time puberty arrives, the ovaries contain this finite pool, maybe 300,000 to 400,000 of these primary oocytes ready to go. That's a huge drop from millions down to hundreds of thousands. Yeah. And then they just wait. Okay. So puberty kicks in. The monthly cycles begin. We've got the ovarian cycle and the endometrial cycle. Our notes say they average about 28 days, but that can vary quite a bit, right? Oh, yeah. 20 to 45 days is considered a normal range for the cycle length. Yeah. And they only stop during pregnancy or, you know, certain health issues. Let's focus first on the ovarian cycle. Happening in the ovaries, three phases, mm. follicular, ovulation, and luteal. Right. And all under the control of FSH and LH from the pituitary. Correct. So each cycle, a group of around 20 primordial follicles gets the signal to start growing. First stage... They become primary follicles, basically. The primary oocytes inside get bigger. Okay. Then they develop into secondary follicles, sometimes called vesicular or antral follicles. This is where things get more complex. The granulosa cells, the ones right around the oocyte, multiply, forming layers. And crucially, another layer forms outside them called the, the saca. The theca. Yeah, the th theca. It has two parts. The theca interna, which is rich in blood vessels and starts making estrogens and progesterone. And the... Uh, the theca externa, which is more fibrous, like a support layer. So you're building this layered structure around the developing egg. Right. These layers are building up. What's pushing this growth, making it accelerate? It's a clever hormonal interplay. Estrogen, made by the follicle itself, actually increases the number of receptors for FSH, that's follicle-stimulating hormone on those granulosa cells. Making them more sensitive to FSH. Exactly. It amplifies the FSH signal. Then FSH and the estrogens together encourage the granulosa cells to develop receptors for LH luteinizing hormone. This lets LH stimulate them too, leading to even more estrogen. And finally, the rising estrogen and LH also push the palaika cells to multiply and make more hormones. So it's like a positive feedback loop within the follicle itself. Precisely. A hormonal snowball effect, you could say, driving its own maturation, getting ready for the next big step. And eventually one follicle usually outpaces the others and becomes the mature dominant one, the graphene follicle. That's the one. What does that fully developed follicle look like? What are its key parts? The graphene follicle is quite sophisticated. Inside, you have the secondary oocyte, which has completed its first meiotic division. It's surrounded by that protective layer, the zona pellucida, and then several layers of granulosa cells called the corona radiata. These actually stay with the egg when it's released. Okay. Then there's the antrum, that fluid-filled space, which is full of follicular fluid rich in hormones and growth factors. And surrounding all that are the multiple layers of granulosa cells, a basement membrane, and then the, the fatica interna and externa. It's a highly organized little package ready for ovulation. Ovulation, that's the main event, right? The release of the egg. Mm. Our notes say it's the release of that haploid secondary oocyte into the peritoneal cavity, typically around day 14 before the next period starts. Mm -hmm. What's the hormonal trigger? What makes it happen? The trigger is a really dramatic shift in hormones. The, the thickest cells hit their peak estrogen production about 48 hours before ovulation. Okay, peak estrogen. And this super high estrogen level does something interesting. It flips the script and has a positive feedback effect on the anterior pituitary. This causes a massive surge in LH levels, can jump six to 10 times baseline, and a smaller but still important two to three fold rise in FSH. The LH surge, that's the key signal. That is the critical signal. It pushes the follicle through its final maturation steps and ultimately triggers ovulation. LH also kicks off the production of other steroid hormones in the follicle, including progesterone, really for the first time in the cycle in any significant amount. So this huge hormonal spike leads to the follicle actually rupturing and releasing the egg. How does that physically happen? Well, the LH surge and the progesterone that starts being produced because of it have a couple of key effects. Progesterone causes the, exter the inaca externa, that outer fibrous layer, to release proteolytic enzymes. Enzymes that break down protein. Exactly. They start to digest and weaken the follicle wall, creating a little weak spot called the stigma. At the same time, you get rapid growth of new blood vessels into the follicle, and prostaglandins are secreted. These cause inflammation and make capillaries leaky, so plasma fluid leaks into the follicle, making it swell up rapidly. Ah, so it swells up and the wall gets weaker? Precisely. The combination of the follicle rapidly swelling and the wall degenerating at the stigma leads to the rupture, and pop, the secondary oocyte is released. It's a very coordinated demolition and release process. Incredibly coordinated. Okay, so how would someone know if ovulation has actually happened? Are there any, like telltale signs? Yeah, there are several indicators people might notice or track. 
Some women feel a bit of pelvic pain mid-cycle, sometimes called Mittelschmerz, German for middle pain. Right. You might also see an increase in vaginal discharge or sometimes even a tiny bit of mid-cycle bleeding because estrogen levels dip slightly just after the peak. Tracking basal body temperature is another method. Temperature shift. Yeah. Progesterone has this thermogenic effect. It raises body temperature slightly. So after ovulation, you typically see a sustained increase of about... 0.2 to 0.5 degrees Celsius, like half a degree Fahrenheit maybe, that lasts until just before the next period. Okay. Clinically, you can detect pregnenolol, that's a breakdown product of progesterone in the urine. An endometrial biopsy would show the uterine lining is in the secretory phase, which is progesterone driven. And finally, cervical mucus changes are a big clue. The mucus, how does that change? Before ovulation, under high estrogen, the mucus is thin, clear, and stretchy, good for sperm. You see two things. Spin bark height, which is its ability to stretch into long threads. Like elastic. Kind of, yeah. And ferning, where if you let it dry on a slide, it forms a fern-like crystal pattern because of the salt content. After ovulation, progesterone takes over, the mucus gets thick, cloudy, and tacky, and both spin bark height and ferning disappear. Fascinating. Okay, the egg is out. Mm -hmm. What happens to the follicle structure left behind in the ovary? That becomes the corpus luteum, right? Exactly. What's left, the granulasa and the lacca cells, undergoes a big transformation. They enlarge, fill up with lipids, take on a yellowish look, hence corpus luteum, which means yellow body. These changed cells are now called lutein cells. And this change, this luteinization, is driven by? Primarily driven by that LH surge. LH is key for forming and then maintaining the corpus luteum. And this corpus luteum has a really important job for the rest of the cycle, doesn't it? It absolutely does. Under continued lower level LH stimulation, it acts like a temporary endocrine gland. It pumps out large amounts of both progesterone and estrogen, but significantly more progesterone. And why is that important? Those hormones, especially the progesterone, are crucial for preparing the uterine lining, the endometrium, to receive a fertilized egg if pregnancy occurs. Right, prepping for implantation. So what happens to the corpus luteum? Does it just stay there? Its fate really depends on whether fertilization happens or not. If there's no pregnancy, it's called the corpus luteum of menstruation. It functions for about 14 days after ovulation, peaks around day 22 of a typical cycle, and then it starts to degenerate, kind of self-destructs. Mm. This breakdown causes the levels of progesterone and estrogen to drop sharply, and that drop is what triggers menstruation, usually starting about two days after the corpus luteum stops functioning. But if fertilization does happen... Then it becomes the corpus luteum of pregnancy. Its life is extended, usually until about the 12th week of gestation. What keeps it going is a hormone called HCG human chorionic gonadotropin. The pregnancy test hormone. That's the one. It's produced by the very early developing embryo and then the placenta. HCG basically mimics LH and tells the corpus luteum, hey, keep making progesterone. Eventually, the placenta takes over, making enough progesterone and estrogen itself, and the corpus luteum isn't needed anymore, and it slowly fades away. Got it. Okay, so we've walked through the ovarian cycle. Now, let's really zoom in on the hormones themselves, the, the masterminds, you could say, FSH, LH, estrogen, and progesterone. Let's start with FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone. What's its pattern during the cycle? Okay, FSH. It's the main driver early on in the follicular phase. At the very beginning of the cycle, when estrogen is low, FSH levels are relatively higher. This stimulates that initial group of primordial follicles to start growing. Right. As those follicles grow and make more estrogen, that estrogen feeds back negatively to the pituitary, telling it to make less FSH. So FSH levels tend to dip mid-follicular phase. But then remember that positive feedback just before ovulation. With the estrogen peak. Yeah. <laughs> High estrogen causes that small but vital two- to three-fold surge in FSH right alongside the big LH surge. They work together for final follicle maturation and ovulation. Then, after ovulation, in the luteal phase, the high estrogen and progesterone from the corpus luteum strongly inhibit FSH, keeping levels low. So its main jobs are early follicle growth, helping with final maturation, and stimulating estrogen production from the granulosa cells. You got it. That sums it up well. Okay, what about LH, luteinizing hormone? We know about the massive surge, but what else is it doing? Well, before the surge, in the follicular phase, LH is secreted at a fairly steady, low basal level. It works with FSH to stimulate the follicles, particularly prompting the, the Lafica cells to make androgens, which the granulosa cells then convert to estrogens. Then comes that huge surge, six to 10 times baseline triggered by peak estrogen. 
That surge is absolutely essential for ovulation and for transforming the ruptured follicle into the corpus luteum. Okay, critical for ovulation and making the corpus luteum. Yes. And then in the luteal phase, after ovulation, LH provides the ongoing signal needed to maintain the corpus luteum and stimulate it to produce progesterone and estrogen. However, the high progesterone levels from the corpus luteum then exert negative feedback, suppressing further LH release, preventing another ovulation in the same cycle. So it triggers ovulation, forms the corpus luteum, maintains it, and regulates hormone production at different stages. Makes sense. Mm. Now, estrogens, where are they coming from and what don't they do? Their effects seem really widespread. Huh. Yeah, estrogens have a lot of jobs. Primarily, they come from the ovaries, the uh, the alica, interna, and granulosa cells in the follicles, and then the lutein cells in the corpus luteum. The placenta is a huge source during pregnancy, and the adrenal cortex chips in a little bit too. Estradiol is the main, most potent one from the ovaries. And their effects. Okay, broad strokes. In the ovaries, they help follicles grow and trigger that LH surge. On the secondary cess organs, Uterus, they build up the endometrium proliferative phase, make the myometrium muscle layer grow, increase its blood flow, make it more sensitive to oxytocin. Cervix thin, watery mucus, ferning spin barkite. Vagina thicken the lining, increase glycogen for acidity. Fallopian tubes help egg transport with motility and cilia. Hmm. Breast fat deposition, duct growth, nipple development at puberty. Wow, okay, that's a huge list already. And they also cause the secondary sex characteristics. Absolutely. That characteristic female fat distribution, softer skin due to vascularity, influence on libido, and maybe even psychological aspects, plus metabolic effects. They help build protein, stimulate bone growth, then closure, help lower LDL cholesterol, affect salt and water balance, calcium retention, and they impact other endocrine glands too, pituitary size, proteins that bind thyroid hormone and cortisol, and regulating FSHLH release itself. They are really far-reaching. Definitely far-reaching. Okay, last of the quartet, progesterone. Where is it from and what are its main gigs? Progesterone's main source is the corpus luteum. After ovulation, those lutein cells churn it out. Smaller amounts come from the follicle cells before ovulation, the placenta during pregnancy, and the adrenal cortex. Its most important role is preparing for and maintaining pregnancy. It's progestational. So effects on the reproductive organs. Big time. Uterus, it, that's exactly right. The endometrial cycle mirrors the ovarian cycle happening in the endometrium, the inner lining of the uterus. It's completely driven by the rise and fall of ovarian estrogens and progesterone. It has its own three phases. Which are? First, the menstrual phase. That's the shedding of the lining when hormone levels drop. Then the proliferative phase, driven by estrogen from the growing follicles, where the endometrium rebuilds and thickens. And finally, the secretory phase, after ovulation, driven mainly by progesterone from the corpus luteum. This makes the endometrium ready for implantation glands, secrete nutrients, blood supply increases. If no pregnancy occurs, the corpus luteum fails, hormones drop, and you're back to the menstrual phase. 